this is Mark Van Gelder of Subvert Gov. Today I wanted to talk about, uh, this is my first video in the Nuclear Power Crash Course. Um, what I wanted to do with this, with these series of videos that I'm going to be producing is I wanted to discuss how nuclear power works and how um, the plants are sort of, I don't really want to go over the specific design criteria, but, uh, but specifically the um, like just a general overview of how nuclear power works. Um, so today, this is part one, which is called How to Split the Atom. Uh, this is the most basic part of nuclear power. Um, this is literally like how it, how it works. Um, and then later we'll go on to how, how we can actually harness that energy that's, that's produced by the nuclear reaction uh, process, how it's actually produced through that fission process, and uh, how we can harvest that into usable energy. So, how to split the atom. Well, let's talk a little bit about me. Um, my name is Mark Van Gelder. Um, I was born in 1981. I was a six-year naval veteran. I went through nuclear power school for the Navy. I served as a nuclear power plant electrician for four and a half years. I was on the USS John C. Stennis, which is a CBN-74. It was a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier located outside of San Diego, and then later it was located outside of um, Seattle. Um, I studied various nuclear power plant accidents in depth during my schooling, and I will be discussing in a later video uh, various famous nuclear power plant accidents. I spent the following five years after I left the Navy as an air separation plant operator. I made liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen with a company called Air Products. So, Today I want to discuss an overview of how nuclear power works. And today we will cover the various topics. We will cover the construction of an atom, the explanation of a nuclear force, an explanation of isotopes, selection of atoms for nuclear power, a brief description of the fission process, and how chain reactions are created. So an overview of the atom. Uh, as you can see, this is an atom. <laughs> To understand nuclear power, we must first understand how it's constructed. The atom is comprised of a nucleus, which contains the neutrons, which in this case are indicated in red, and the protons, which are indicated in blue. Electrons, which are green, surround the nucleus. Um, if you'll notice, in the nucleus itself, which is the center part of the atom, uh, there are positively charged protons in the nucleus. Um, now normally, you know, if, if you're a thinking person, you'd be wondering, why do all of those positively charged ions or parts of positively charged particles, the protons, how do they stay together? And uh, why don't they repel each other like, like they would if they were magnetic? Because they most certainly would. Two protons, you put them side by side and they would repel each other. Um, uh, so they should repel each other, shouldn't they? Well, there's actually a thing called the nuclear force. Uh, nuclear force is an invisible force that causes the nucleons and we, I use the term nucleons because it means uh, protons and neutrons together. Uh, basically anything that's in the nucleus, which you can see are protons and neutrons, anything that's in the nucleus is considered a nucleon. And uh, this force called the nuclear force physically binds them together. Um, the force itself is very strong, but it's really short ranged. Uh, it doesn't have much of a, it's kind of like a, like a, a spider web in a sense. Uh, very strong but also very short ranged. Um, it doesn't have much of an effect uh, outside of outside of a very a very near uh, or a very close influence. So as long as these so th this nuclear force is very strong and as long as all of these nucleons are bundled together uh, they will not split. Uh, they're physically held together by this nuclear force. But if the nucleons spread apart from each other, the nuclear force will stop holding them together and they can split. So how do we get these uh, protons to sort of separate from each other? So how do we split the atom? Well, to describe atomic stability, um, imagine if you would like jello. Uh, you have these two jello pieces here uh, that you can sort of see gauge in their size. Uh, if you were to flick one of them with your finger, which one do you think would flick would would jiggle more? Of course, the larger Jello would. Um, and the same is true for atoms. 
So when we when we decide uh, which kind of atoms we're going to use for uh, for the uh, the process of, of fission, we need to really consider its size. Um, the size of each atom's nucleus is determined by its isotope. So, for instance, here in this picture, we have two helium isotopes. Uh, they're both considered helium because, if you'll notice, in both of them, they both have two red dots, and those two red dots are protons. Any, any atom which has two protons in its nucleus is considered a helium atom. That's what makes it a helium atom. So they're both considered helium atoms. But if you'll notice, they have a different number of neutrons. Like the, the helium-3 has one neutron and the helium-4 has, has two neutrons. So the isotope is determined by the total number of nucleons, which is protons and neutrons together. So in this case, you have helium-3, which has a total of three nucleons. And helium-4 has a total of four nucleons. Uh, many elements, including helium, have stable and re radioactive isotopes. Um, radioactivity of all the known isotopes is available on what's called the chart of the nuclides. And that's available for free online. Um, you can find other videos, pos probably to, to explain how it works, but I will be making my own video uh, to explain it um, in a little bit more simple terms than how, than how I've seen it presented in the past. And I'll discuss that in a different video. So, but the problem with helium is, is that it's very small. It, it's not going to be very wiggly, and it's going to be nearly impossible to split. Um, in fact, it's damn near impossible to split. So, we need to get something that's bigger. In this case, we use big atoms. Most reactors today use either uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Now, you'll, you see the way that th this is written, um, these numbers. The 235 means that's the total number of nucleons. The 92 in uranium means that uranium has 92 protons, which it always does. So every uranium isotope will have that 92 because that 92 protons indicates that it's uranium. And the 235 is the total number of nucleons. So that's protons and neutrons together, which comes out to what, about 143? Yeah, 143 neutrons in, that, in, in uranium-235. They also use, as I said, plutonium-239, uh, depending on the style of reactor. So these, these uranium atoms as, and plutonium atoms, as you can see, they're very, very big um, compared to this helium atom I showed you. As you can see, the helium atom was only like four nucleons. This has like 235, 239 nucleons. They're considerably bigger, so it's like essentially a massive piece of jello. So um, it's massive, it's moderately stable, it doesn't naturally want to separate from itself. And that's about how we like it, just to be right on that ragged edge of wanting to split from itself. So as we get higher in the periodic table, and as the atoms become more massive, the nuclear force becomes less and less a factor in holding the nucleus together, and that makes it easier to split. This is due to the short range of, these, of this nuclear force. To get an atom to split, you need to hit it with something small. And so, in this case, we would use a stray neutron. And this is the process of how a uranium atom is split and nuclear power works. As you can see, we have a neutron indicated at the top. It hits a uranium-235 uranium atom. Um, the neutron is absorbed, and the atom becomes uranium-236. Now, as you can see with the addition of a new neutron, it now has a new nucleon. So 235 plus a neutron makes it 236. Now it becomes uranium-236. But this uranium-236 just got hit with something, and it starts to cause a disruption in the atom, almost like it's been shot by a bullet, and it kind of starts to wiggle. Um, and gradually, as you see on the left-hand side, the uranium atom, due to the repulsion of the positively charged protons in the nucleus, imagine that there's a whole bunch of, of, of protons, a whole bunch of positively charged particles in, the, in this, this picture to the right. As it starts to, to split, or as, as it starts to spread out, as it starts to jiggle, um, what, you, what you actually end up happening is that, is that all the protons on the, one, on the one long end and the other proton on the other long end, um, the, or the, those protons overcome the nuclear force that is now weakened due to, due to the, the, the jiggling. Now, now it no longer is, is nice and bundled together. Now it's kind of starting to split, split apart. And gradually the protons physically um, repulse from each other 
and they create two new atoms. In this case, these are called um, uh, fission product daughters. So, sort of thing, gradually the uranium atom, due to the repulsion of the positively charged protons in the nucleus, will start to form a dumbbell shape. Restriction between the two ends of the dumbbell causes the nuclear force to be weakened. And eventually, the magnetic repulsion of the two ends of the nucleus overpower the nuclear force, and they split from each other. And this is a process called fission, which is also known as spl the splitting of an atom. Uh, this is not to be confused with fusion. Uh, which is the type of energy that our sun that our sun uses, where it, where it physically fuses two hydrogen atoms into a helium atom. Um, this is a process called fission, um, and fusion is is a power potential power source in the future, but we don't uh, have the technology for it yet. Uh, primarily because in order to operate, it needs to run at millions of degrees uh, to to operate properly, and we just don't have anything to to maintain that. Uh, that kind of temperature without like turning it, it's basically just gasifying. So this is, this process as I said before is called fission, uh, produces what are called fission product daughters. In the case of, of this, uh, this example here on the right, we have Krypton 92 and Barium 141 are the daughters. Um, and these daughters are basically just a random, you know, however the protons lay on which side they lay, how, how many proton, how many, however many neutrons are on each side, whatever it is, they just, you know, however, however it lands, that that's how it lands, and that's the kind of uh, fission product daughters you're going to have. In this case, like I said, it's totally random. Um, it also ejects a random number of neutrons to perform the next reactions. In this case, three neutrons are released, as shown here on the bottom. And so here is another example of the, <clears throat> the fission process. And this one sort of more accurately describes what, what the dumbbell process and the repulsion I was talking about. The neutron hits the uranium atom, the uranium-235 atom, turns into uranium-236, which causes it to uh, physically separate from each other as it jiggles. And then the positive charges between those, those two sides of the dumbbell physically overpower the nuclear force and cause the uranium atom to split. And then in this case produces three neutrons. So how does it work? The split of the atom creates heat, um, which is, and the, it's also, uh, and also as, as, the, as the neutrons collide with things, that also produces some heat. Um, but uh, uh, this heat we, we then remove, we turn that heat into steam, and then the steam is used to power, power um, a, a power plant. So it's basically no different than a coal-fired power plant in the sense of how, how it physically works. Um, so the split of the atom creates heat. Uh, each of these neutrons from, from these examples, in this case we have three, each of these neutrons have the possibility of conducting their own reaction with another uranium atom. Uh, since the number of neutrons produced per fission can vary anywhere theoretically from 0 to 144, even though you're not going to have 144 neutrons released from a reaction, it is theoretically possible. Um, typically, it's a, it's a small number that are, that are released. Um, but it would still be difficult to control any power plant on a small scale where you have basically random, random amounts of, of whatever coming out. But we're able to control these nuclear power plants thanks to quantum mechanics. And um, quantum mechanics basically says that uh, it's kind of like flipping a coin. You can't predict what, how, how the coin's going to flip, but on a large enough scale, you know that the coins are going to flip about 50-50, heads and tails. The same is true here. We can't say exactly how many neutrons are going to pr be produced on each individual reaction. But on a large scale, we can average it out to about 2.5 neutrons per reaction. And so, on a large enough scale, we know that this is, that this is about the, the speed at which it's going to, uh, um, it's going to, it's going to produ produce reactions. So the intention of nuclear power is to create heat, so we need a lot of reactions to produce the heat we need. If you start with the first generation in which one neutron splits an atom, and I put the word creates, but it's not really creating, it ejects two and a half new neutrons per generation you can see how we can exponentially increase reaction rates. For example, in the first generation, you have one neutron, which, coll which collides with uh, one uranium atom, 
and then that battle print is on average about two hundred, two and a half, um, you know, uranium atoms or two, two and a half uh, uh, neutrons to undergo another reaction with with uranium atoms, which will then produce six point three, and the next generation could produce fifteen point six to thirty nine point one. Next gen, and then you know, the sixth generation, you could have almost a hundred neutrons uh, per gen or by the sixth generation from just the one neutron to begin with. And when the reaction rate, like when we, we want a certain number of, of reactions to occur, and that'll, that'll be sort of our stable reaction rate. When the reaction rate we desire is achieved, the plan is designed to allow us to control power levels, um, to control how high and how uh, low we want, uh, we want our, our power to run. Um, this is the, the idea of a controlled chain reaction is designed to prevent plants from overheating and melting down. So, as you can see, uh, this is, the, that was the part one of the video of the crash course of nuclear power. Uh, how to split the atom. Uh, all of my information is available here on this final slide. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, please do so. I like uh, answering questions if you guys have any, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye.